This is the Sears Total Video System, and if you've never heard of it before, you're not alone. I'm Matt D'Amico, and welcome to episode 69 of Retro Bits. Just over a year ago, I was browsing Craigslist, as one does, and an ad for an unusual CRT monitor popped up in my search results. What caught my eye was the claim that the display was for use with the Commodore 128 and had an RGB input. I'd never heard of this model before, but it was reasonably priced at $100 and in working condition. So I reached out and contacted the seller. I wanted to find out more about the display, so I took to Google as well as the Internet Archive. But information about the model was scarce. A few old Usenet posts talked about trying to source the proprietary RGB cable, and a handful of magazines from back in the day made mention of it, but that was really all the two meager pages of search results could produce. No specs, no service manual, nothing really concrete except mention of the $349 MSRP, just under $1,000 when adjusted for inflation. Next, I started paging through scans of the 1985 Sears Holiday Catalog. On page 600, I found what I was looking for. While the picture in the ad wasn't 100% identical, the lower bezel is black instead of beige, there was no mistaking that this was indeed the same total video system as the one on Craigslist. What's more, it had a few specs. 13-inch tube, comb filter, all three video signals, and what's this? A reference to a page in the 1985 Fall Big Book. And in that fall catalog, I found the exact same display, but designated as an LXI series instead. Same specs, same price, and they also had for sale the accompanying DB9 RGB and composite DIN cables for use with the Commodore 128. My interest piqued, I arranged to meet the seller about an hour away in order to acquire this rare beast. And here it is, in all its beige glory. The seller explained to me that he was the original owner, having purchased the monitor around Christmas of 85 for use with his Commodore 128. He had since sold the computer and was now looking for a good home for the display. As I seemed to be unable to say no to stray and orphan tech, the total video system followed me home that day, and now, more than a year later, I'm sharing it with you. One neat thing about having purchased the Sears Total Video System from the original owner was that he had retained the original documentation in this Sears Business System Center bag, which if you haven't heard of the Sears Business System Center, you're not alone, I hadn't either, but apparently they had a separate brick and mortar business of selling computers, calculators, word processors, recorders, communication, so basically office equipment from separate locations, and there were 49 of those locations throughout the country. Now, the Sears Business System Center business went out of business, or rather was sold, in 1993. So it's particularly neat to have this artifact from those days, along with the monitor from where it was purchased. So let's take a look inside and see what came with the display. First up, we've got the UHF antenna, which serves no purpose today, but, you know, Pretty neat to have that original. Second, there's a pouch of literature. We'll take a look at that in a moment. And finally, we have the original owner's manual in pristine, like new condition. It doesn't even look like it's been read before. So we'll take a look at that as well. All right, let's take a look at what's inside the pouch. First up, we have safety tips, take a look at that, and also an envelope. And inside this envelope, we have a plastic sheet of numbers that punch out, and we'll take a look at how those work in a minute as well. Setting those aside for a moment, let's take a look at the safety tips. Here we have the Sears safety tips, important safeguards that nobody ever reads these things, but let's take a look just for fun. Looks to be pretty much the standard stuff you would expect. Don't use your system in the middle of a rainstorm. Don't dance near your TV when it's on a crash cart. That's good advice, I guess. <laughs> I love these illustrations. Look at this. We've got a kid 
who is apparently trying to work on the family TV with a handsaw, perhaps? Yeah, that's, that's pretty good advice, I would say. And this dude appears to be KO'd by his hi-fi set. I'm not sure why he's been knocked out, but uh, yeah, I guess whatever he did, don't do that. So, important safety tips. Moving along, we have the owner's manual for the total video system. There's the model number there. Know your unit. <laughs> yeah, good advice. On the inside, we have safety precautions, unpacking and positioning, connecting the power. It talks about the polarized plug and to not defeat the safety feature of this plug. Was this something new in 1985? I really don't remember, but they wouldn't have put this warning in if people hadn't tried it. So that's interesting. I do not remember back then if that was something new. We have literature about connecting the antennas, more about connecting the antennas, and the operating controls for the system. A few things of note is there's a green display switch, which allows you to use the monitor in monochrome. There's a mode select key to switch between RF, composite, and RGB. Channel selection keys are soft keys. They're not mechanical. They are soft keys and they're programmable. And then we have screen compression and the hideaway controls compartment, which is documented here. This is how you program, well, not program, but mechanically set the channel selection keys. And then you've got your standard CRT controls for color, tint, brightness, things like that. In addition, we have how to program the channels and select UHF and VHF. One button color, so we have an electronic adjustment for the best color picture reception. We have external inputs, so as we've seen, um, composite, and then there's RF, and we also have RGB, which is on a proprietary connector here, but it's nice that they provided the pinout for it because we're going to need to build a cable for this proprietary connector. Now it says it's compatible with the IBM PC and PC Junior computers, so this is RGB with intensity, and we can see that there's intensity right there on pin one. So this should also work with the Commodore 128's 80 column mode. Pretty cool. There's a screen compression button that we just saw, and this allows a feature to provide improved visible clarity of computer generated characters. So basically it takes and reduces the overscan and smushes the scan lines together to make the characters appear more compact. So we'll take a look at that. And there's also the green display switch, which can help in certain situations where you want to view monochrome, especially if you've got a composite signal that's 80 columns or multicolor, like the Apple II's NTSC output, which in certain situations has that rainbow effect. This could get rid of that and make it much clearer and much more visible. We'll take a look at that as well. And then we have troubleshooting, maintenance, and a matrix here of how to solve your problems. FCC notice, and there we go. The Sears Total Video System Owner's Manual. Here on the front panel, we have Total Video System. I just think that's a great name, I love that. Here is the green display button that we looked at from the manual, as well as the mode select button. And below that is the volume control. Here on the right side, we have the power button, as well as the screen compression button that we looked at, and the soft keys for selecting the channel. If we turn on the power here, we can see that the soft keys light up when pressed. And there are those numbers that we looked at from the little pouch where you can put in your own custom numbers. Here on the side, you can see that there's this little tab, and if you take a coin or a screwdriver and gently pry on it, it will come out, and that reveals the number panel where you can slide in new numbers depending on what pre-programmed channels you'd like to set up for each of the soft keys. And speaking of pre-programming, behind this door on the right side, we have the controls for just that. The way it works is that for each of the soft keys labeled A through L, you can select the band, UHF or VHF, with this control. You can select the channel using this control here, and then you can adjust the fine tuning of that channel with the pot in the middle. They provide a little tool for making those adjustments here, and there was a spare of these tools attached to the safety guide. Of course, this is all analog NTSC video, which is no longer in use. So it really doesn't matter what I program these to, there's no signal that I'm gonna be receiving with this. 
As long as I've got channels three and four programmed, then I can use this set with any of my classic consoles or computers that only have RF output. And one last thing, this control is how you activate the one touch color function. When this wheel is in this position and the door closes, the plunger rests inside this empty space. When you rotate the wheel 180 degrees and then you close the door, the plunger presses this little switch and activates the one touch color function. Now, why they didn't just put a toggle switch here that you turned on and off, I don't know. We've got this crazy little wheel contraption here. But uh, yeah, I've never seen anything like that before either. Very interesting. Around the back, we have our VHF antenna taped together for transport, connected here to the 300 ohm input. Above that, the UHF input, and below that, a 75 ohm coaxial input. Down here, we have cable management built in for our power cord, which is nice, and a sticker that says the manufacturing date is April of 1985. Here we've got our sticker for Sears Roebuck & Co. made with parts from the USA and from Japan. So uh, ostensibly the picture tube inside is probably from a Japanese manufacturer. Doesn't say who though. Now one thing that's interesting about the coax input here is that when not in use, you're supposed to take this little jumper out of its storage hole, rotate it, and put it in to the coax connector like that. Now, I've never seen this before, but I assume what this is is termination to provide impedance matching and prevent any reflections in the signal, but to have to manually insert it like that when not in use and then take it out and put it into its little storage hole when you are using the coax is very unusual and I've never seen that before. Looking here at the other video inputs, we can see we have composite and mono audio inputs. No split YC for the Commodore 64 128, no S-Video, this monitor would predate S-Video. And then we have RGB input and audio for that. And you'll notice this connector here is somewhat proprietary. It's called an EIJ8 connector. And you don't see these on too many consumer grade devices. They show up on Sony PVMs. They're called the VTR connector and they connect to videotape recorders and transmit composite signals. But in this case, it's used for RGB and these are pretty hard to find. So we're gonna take a look at that in a moment. Next, I think I'd like to test out the Total Video Systems RF input and what better way to do that than a second generation video game console, in this case, the ColecoVision, which natively only supports RF video. Now it has been an absolute age since the last time I used an RF modulator. Could be 40 years or more. So this is a very strange feeling using one of these again for the first time in so long. Oh, and we can't forget a little bypass for the coax input here. And with the system all hooked up, all we need to do now is decide what game we want to play. How about Donkey Kong Jr.? And there we go. Looking pretty good on the camera, but in real life, a little bit crusty. Some of that could just be accounted for RF, which is particularly nasty, and some of it could be the fact that both the console and the display are all original. They've never been serviced or recapped. The text is pretty hard to read. Game looks okay. Yeah, it may not show up really well, but there's a lot of shadowing around some of the characters, especially the words. On the black backgrounds, it's not too hard to read them, but on some other screens, it's very difficult to make them out. I'm gonna switch to a different game. We'll take a look. Yeah, the problem seems to be a lot worse when there's lots of colors on the screen and lots of motion at the same time. Hopefully this will give you an idea of what I'm talking about.
Yeah, it might be easier to see it here in Ladybug, but all of the characters, there's shadowing and ghosting around all of them. And that, again, could just be due to RF or it could be something wrong with the display or the console itself. So we'll try composite next and see how that works. But before we move on, some of you may be asking, well, what happens when you remove that little jumper from the coaxial input on the back? And this is what happens when you remove the jumper. No signal at all. So clearly that little jumper is carrying the RF signal. And when you remove it, you get nothing. Moving on, we now have the Commodore 64 connected to the Sears Total Video System using Composite. Remember, we don't have Split YC and we don't have S-Video, so Composite's the best we're gonna get out of this system. Let's take a look. Oh yeah, right away we can tell this is way better than RF. The colors are well-defined, there's no flashing, there's no jitter like there was before. There is still some ghosting around the characters, but it's greatly diminished from what it was before. Now one thing I noticed is that while you can select the channel you want, as well as the input, when you power cycle the display, it always comes back on channel two on the RF input. And so you're going to have to press the input select one or two times to get back to the input that you actually wanted and the channel you wanted. So there is a drawback to the system is that with using these electronic soft keys instead of mechanical switches, there's no persistent storage of your setting. And it could be kind of annoying to have to change that input every time you wanted to use composite on this display. Now, here is a good example of a problem that we have even with the composite video, and that is that some of this text up here is barely legible. The dark blue on black and the light blue on black, you can barely make them out. Also, if you'll notice, the red is bleeding into the white everywhere, and that may be a function of composite, but it may be the monitor setting. Now, what I've done is I've tried to adjust the color, and if you lower it any amount, it just washes out, and if you raise it, it just oversaturates the red and makes the blue blur. Even up there, it's illegible. So you've got to lower the color down where it's not too saturated. And then the brightness is already all the way up. I can only lower it. This is about halfway on the brightness adjustment. This is all the way up on the brightness adjustment. And even so, it's hard to read that word demo. It's actually easier on the camera than it is in person to see that. It's almost blending into the background. So the range of adjustment isn't good and that makes me think that it's one of two things. Either the tube is tired or this monitor needs to be recapped. Now, I don't see any evidence that there's any burn-in on the screen and it was a one owner device used on a Commodore 128. So I don't expect that it has that many hours on it. So it may simply be that the capacitors are tired and the range of adjustment isn't where it should be anymore. Now here on the other end of the spectrum, quite literally is GIA 64, which doesn't make use of color very much. And in this grayscale environment, things look really sharp. In fact, this monitor is very crisp and very clear, even with just composite here. So that is looking pretty good. Here where there's color, um, especially these bright colors, there's still some ghosting, which makes it hard to kind of discern what that icon is supposed to be. So clearly we have some issues with color on this color display, but in grayscale operation, it looks pretty good. Yeah, that is totally usable. That looks really good here. Not bad for composite at all. Another thing I wanted to try was doing 80 column text on the Commodore 64 using only composite, which is notoriously hard to do for this machine and only looks good on certain displays like the Sony PVM. So here we have Strike Term, which is based on Nova Term, which has 80 column ANSI support. And I'm going to switch into 80 column mode now. And there we go. This should be recognizable text. We can definitely make out Z modem ANSI 9600, but this should be a screen of legible text. And unfortunately it is just garbage. It's illegible in its entirety. Now I was hoping that using the green screen mode would make that more legible, but I don't think that it is going to be able to be saved 
So it appears that 80 column text on the Sears total video system from the Commodore 64 over composite is a no-go. I was experimenting with that green button a little bit more, and here's one fun thing you can do. Take your Commodore 64 boot screen and turn it into the Commodore 128 palette, just like that. Okay, that's not very useful, and it doesn't actually make it any more legible either, but kind of neat. Here's something else I noticed about the green mode button, is that it's not just black and green like a monochrome monitor, it's different shades of green, and so brighter colors get represented in a brighter shade of green, and darker colors get represented in a darker shade of green. Here, I'll show you what I mean. This text almost completely disappears while this text is very bright and this text is very bright and legible. In fact, reading text like this is very legible, and I think on an Apple II where you have that multicolored, low resolution text mode, it would look pretty good. But here, it doesn't really add anything to it. Okay, here we are in IK Plus one more time. I just wanted to try out the green mode in the game that was kind of washed out with the colors before. So when we turn it on, the red character sort of disappears into the red background almost entirely. So clearly not meant to be used in this capacity. It doesn't add any value here in gaming, but perhaps in certain text modes on certain machines, it would be of benefit. Now I can already hear you in my head asking, are you going to show the Apple II multicolor text mode? And the answer is yes, of course I am. And here's what that looks like now. On a composite display, this text is relatively difficult to read. So let's turn on the green mode now. Oh yeah, much better. I don't know how bad it came through on the camera before, but this is much more legible and this is clearly the type of use case they had in mind when they provisioned this feature. Let's take a closer look at this unusual digital RGB connector. As we saw in the catalog, Sears sold a matching cable with a standard 9-pin D-sub connector for use with PCs and the Commodore 128. Unfortunately, the Craigslist seller accidentally shipped this rare cable when he sold his computer sometime prior to our meeting. Known as EIAJ, or Electronic Industries Association of Japan, this interface is typically found only on professional equipment. On my PVM, the connector is used as a video tape recorder interface, carrying composite video and audio. Note the 9-pin digital RGB input on this display. I'm not sure why Sears didn't use this common and readily available connector instead of opting for something much more proprietary. I needed a cable to test the monitor, so I took to eBay. Over the course of a year, my save searches turned up only a few results. As it turns out, these cables are super rare. This example is selling for over $200. Hard pass. The Craigslist seller helpfully emailed the party to whom he had sold the Commodore with the hope of getting the cable back, but never received a reply. After many hours of fruitless searching on Google, I stumbled across something interesting. The EIAJ8 connector was also used by certain CRT monitors sold by Taxan, a long-defunct company that you may recognize from the handful of NES games they published. Armed with this knowledge, I was able to find a cable with the correct connector intended for use with a Laser 128 that was still stocked on this site for only $10. Score! All right, here it is, the mythical Laser 128 to Taxan EIAJ8 plug. Let's get that opened up. And here it is, this is such a weird plug. You don't see these at all, and it's really cool that I was able to find this thing. Now, I have a couple options for this cable. I could just cut off this end and install a normal D-sub 9-pin connector and run it through to the Commodore 128 and other CGA things like the Tandy 1000. Or I could try and preserve this Laser 128 and build an adapter. And since this is such a rare cable, I think that's what I'm gonna do. 
Before I build an adapter, I need to make sure that all of the pins that we need to use are connected through to this 15 pin D sub connector. We're gonna need RGB, intensity, horizontal and vertical sync, and at least one ground pin. So pretty much all of the pins should be connected here, except for one, the two grounds may be connected together. Let's take a look. Unfortunately, I found that pin two, which is the red pin on the Sears Total Video System, does not connect to anything on the Laser 128 15 pin connector. So I'm either going to need to rewire this end or just take this connector and wire it straight into a DB9 connector instead. So here's what I found. Pin two is not wired to anything. There is a white conductor that I could use, but it's been cut short. However, here, pin six, this brown conductor, isn't being used at all by the Sears Total Video System. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to move the brown conductor from pin six to pin two, and then I'm going to remove the 15 pin connector and just add a nine pin connector instead. It won't let me save the Laser 128 cable, but I don't have a Laser 128 anyway, so it is what it is. All right, with that done, now all I need to do is desolder the 15 pin connection and solder on a nine pin. Using the pinout in the manual, I was able to create a table that shows the function EIAJ8 pin number, the color of the wire, and the corresponding DB9 pin that I need to connect it to. And here's our DB9 connector. Make sure that we're using a male end for CGA or Commodore 128 video. And we're ready to go. I'm going to start by tinning all of the top connectors just to make it easier for me later. Now we'll do the same thing on the other side. And there we go. So true to form, when I reversed the connector to solder on the back row, I did not account for the reverse of the ordering of the pins and I soldered everything in backwards. So I need to desolder the four pins on the lower tier reverse them and put them back. So let me do that now. And there we go. One EIAJ8 RGB connection to a standard DB9 plug. Let's test it out and see how it works. Here we go, the EIAJ8 RGB cable. Perfect fit, nice positive engagement, and it locks in place and you have to actually release it to take it out. So that's actually a pretty nice connector, even though it is rare and unique and proprietary pretty much. Not too bad. I was going to connect the total video system to the Commodore 128, just like the original owner had purchased it for, but I was recently reminded that it's now Septandy, so we're gonna use the Tandy 1000HX instead. And I think they look pretty handsome together. They're a nice complement. Maybe it looks better on the 1000, the big box, but it looks pretty good here. So let's fire it up and see what happens. And there's nothing. There's nothing on the screen at all. So I scratched my head for a while and I couldn't figure out whether I had built the cable wrong or the monitor just didn't work when RGB was selected, but then I remembered something. Inside the little trap door, there's a separate setting for RGB brightness. And as it turned out, the setting was turned way too low. 
So if I turn it up, let's see what we got now. Aha! Success! We have RGB video. And it's looking pretty sharp too. Yeah, the quality of the video doesn't look half bad. There's no mention in the manual or anywhere online what the dot pitch of this monitor is, but I suspect it's relatively high given how it looks with composite, and even if you look really close up, it's, it's still not as sharp as the Commodore 1084 or the Sony PVM, which has a really crisp 0.25 millimeter dot pitch or something like that. So I suspect We've got a shadow mask display with a relatively high dot pitch. That's my guess. But again, it could be the capacitors. Uh, it's still completely perfectly legible at 80 columns, so it looks pretty good here. And while we're zoomed in on the screen, let me press the screen compression button here on the side. And there we go. That's what it looks like with screen compression. It removes some of the overscan and compresses the scan lines and you end up with a more compact looking text display. Yeah, it looks good, but I'm so used to seeing the text with the scan lines in this format, and this looks fine to me. There's no need to compress it like that. One thing you will notice though is that the A prompt is hidden down there, and there's no external controls to adjust the V size, so I'll probably have to open up the monitor in order to, to scale it, or recapping it may bring things back into alignment. But green screen, green compressed, green uncompressed. Yeah, some neat controls, but I like it just like that anyway. And here's Deskmate running on the Tandy 1000, looking pretty sharp. So that should give you a pretty good idea of what it looks like close up. It's hard to remove all the moray from the screen when you're photographing it, but I'm trying my best here. I can try and adjust the focus a little bit too. That might help. Soften it up a little bit though. You really want to see what it looks like. Yeah. Filming a screen, a CRT, is just really difficult. But it looks pretty good. I think you'll agree. So there we have it, the 1985 Sears Total Video System. Quite a versatile little display, given its near total obscurity. So what do you think, is it a keeper? Should I restore and recap this unique piece of history? Or leave it as it is, patina and all? Let me know what you think in the comments, and don't forget to do the other YouTube things as well. I hope you enjoyed this bit, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.